So, as I mentioned earlier, I just got back from Spain. I was away for six weeks hiking the Camino del Norte, which goes along the northern coast of Spain, all the way to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, for folks who don't know much, if anything, about the Camino, the Camino is a series of routes that lead across Spain and also throughout much of Europe uh, to the cathedral there. Uh, legend holds that St. James, one of the disciples, had spent time preaching the gospel in Spain after Jesus died, and that he, later he returned to Judea after he saw a vision of the Virgin Mary on the bank of the Ebro River in northeastern Spain. And once he got back to, to Judea, he was ordered to be beheaded by King Herod, who's known for being a very nice guy in the Bible, of course, so that, that tracks with his other behavior. And uh, he was beheaded, uh, supposedly because St. James had such a hot temper and was stirring up trouble uh, in the Jerusalem area. And his head is believed to be buried under the altar at the Armenian Apostolic Church of St. James in the Armenian quarter of Jerusalem. But St. James' followers said they took the body and they put it on a boat and actually smuggled it back to Spain where he had last been preaching. And then they carried it inland and buried it in Santiago. And that's where the cathedral is now built. And it's uh, Santiago de Compostela, the field of stars, uh, because it's said to be under the Milky Way. And then all, you can follow the Milky Way to get to Santiago, to get to this cathedral to honor St. James. So the Camino is known as the Way of St. James. So I don't know how true the legends are. There are a few things that are a little curious about the story. Uh, but I will say that this was a source of great pride among Christians in northern Spain during the Middle Ages. Uh, at that time, the uh, Muslim Moors had come from northern Africa and had invaded Spain and Portugal and taken over much of that region, except for this sort of corner, the northwest corner of Spain, where the Christians maintained control. And this was a big um, source of pride and kind of a way to help Christians at that time feel like, okay, we're still fighting, we still have something, uh, some like stronghold in this region, unlike the Moors, and uh, by doing this walk to Santiago. Uh, so it became a very popular walk across Europe. So even though the Camino is usually talked about as the routes going through Spain and Portugal to get there, they actually lead all through Europe because people would travel through Europe to get there. And, um, and it was, uh, became such a popular route uh, that Pope Alexander VI actually declared it one of the three great pilgrimages of Christendom, with the others being to Jerusalem and then to Rome. Uh, and actually, the Compostela that I received, the certificate from the Catholic Church that you receive after you've walked at least the last 100 kilometers or biked at least the last 200, uh, is in Latin. And it's said to be the same Compostela that you would get for the last 1,000 years. And they actually write your name in Latin, which is a bit confusing because none of us had Latin names. We're like, wait a minute, what is this? Uh, but that's the certificate that they've been giving for about 1,000 years now. Uh, in any case, the various routes to Santiago have been used by pilgrims since the 9th century. Uh, and today they're traveled by more than 400,000 people. So this is very, very popular, increasingly so in the last few years. Uh, so as I mentioned, I traveled the Camino del Norte. So Rosa, if you could show the first slide. Yes, so this is the route that I traveled, more or less. So it goes along the northernmost route, uh, northernmost coast. Uh, the most popular one is the Camino Frances, which is south of that. I didn't want to do that one because I heard it was very hot. And I am like, I'm from Vancouver, I am like Stephen, where I'm very used to the rain and can handle hiking in the rain. I cannot handle hiking in 40 degree temperatures. Uh, so I'd rather deal with the rain along the coast uh, than the extreme heat. So this is the route I traveled. Uh, and next slide, please, Rosa. And uh, this is also one of the longest Caminos. So this was 840 kilometers. So it took a little while. And uh, it goes from Irun, which is on the border with France, uh, up in the corner of Spain, all the way to Santiago. So it's quite long. Um, I didn't pick it just because I like doing hard things. Uh, again, it was because I thought it would be, the temperature would be a little more manageable for me. Uh, but also I'd heard it's the most beautiful, if not one of the most beautiful Caminos. And I, I haven't done the other ones, so I can't really say. But it was very beautiful. So I think that's probably true. And also, I have this kind of personality that I don't think things through. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Like, lots of other people in their 70s do this. I'm 39. I'm sure I'll be fine. And I think I underestimated how hard it was going to be, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, Rosa, next slide, please. 
Uh, so it's definitely one of the most beautiful. This area is around Arayo. This was on day three, going to Zaruts. It's so beautiful there. You're going through farmland. We joked that no one actually lives in northern Spain because for most of the time, you're just out in nature. And we were hiking on average about seven hours a day. And I say hiking, so people say they walk the Camino. But my pilgrim family and I had a discussion about this. And if you're carrying all your stuff, which we were, and if you're doing this for an average around seven hours a day, and if the road is not paved most of the time, and if you have elevation that you're dealing with at least half the time, and you need hiking poles, I think it counts as hiking. <laughs> I don't think you're just walking. We, we're like, at this point, we are definitely hiking this thing. And, uh, but it's beautiful. So the inland areas we're going through look like that. People said I was a very good photographer. I actually don't think I am. It's just everything you see is so beautiful. And you're out in nature, in the sunshine or the rain, all day, every day. It's amazing. Uh, next slide, please. Also, you're along the coast. So the coast looks like this. So you're hiking along this almost the whole time. It's so beautiful. You saw a million beaches, even in a given day. Someone would say, oh, I went swimming at the beach. And you're like, which one? We saw seven beaches today. Could have been any of them. It's just spectacular. It's so, so beautiful. Uh, so yes, it's definitely, it, it's, it's really just amazing in that way. And then also, next slide, please. You are getting to stay in places like this. So this is Sobrado dos Monxas. This is about a thousand-year-old monastery and church, you get to stay in these places. And so you have a little passport that says you're a pilgrim, so you get it at the beginning. So it allows you to stay in pilgrim only, they call it albergues, uh, which are hostels for pilgrims. Many of them are donation only. This one was 10 euros. 10 euros was pretty average, so you pay 10 euros a night to get to stay in places like this. This one was maybe about I don't know how many days, four days from the end. It's very famous, it's huge. You get to go to a Vesper service if you want. The monks there were amazing. The one, Lawrence, was hilarious. Um, you, you're sleeping in bunk beds in these kind of places, and this one houses about 100 pilgrims a night. <clears throat> and at the time I was doing this, there, we estimated there were around 50 of us that were starting out and that were kind of traveling from town to town around the same pace. And, uh, and later by the end, it was more people. And then at the very end, all the Caminos meet up. And I should say the symbol for the pilgrimage is the scallop shell. So pilgrims actually tie scallop shells to their pack. And uh, I bought scallop shell earrings at the end when I got to Santiago. And you see on the way markers, there are scallop shells everywhere. And that's both because scallops are very well known as one of the staple foods in Galicia, uh, where Santiago is. But also in a scallop, all the lines meet in one place. And that's what it's like in Santiago. So all the, everything leads to Santiago at the end. So it's really amazing. So yes, so it's so gorgeous. You're in nature. You're getting more exercise than I myself had ever gotten in my life. Again, you're, you're walking. We were averaging around 22 to 25 kilometers a day. Uh, my longest day, we did 36 kilometers because we got lost. And we were very unhappy when we got in. Uh, my friends Nikki, Alex, and I kind of hobbled in. And then when we had to go down the stairs later to get food from the supermarket, we walked down the stairs sideways because we couldn't really move that much. And they said, what happened to you? You look like you just got back from battle. Uh, but you look like that once you get past 30 kilometers a day. So again, this is a hike. This is not a walk. I'm, I've become pretty firm about this. Uh, but yes, next so slide, please. So the thing is, it's hard. So it's the first thing you should know is it's quite hard. And this is where past me just assumes I'll be fine always, which is not always true. And uh, it's very difficult. So this was what I affectionately call the river of mud. We got this maybe three or four weeks in, and it was about four or five kilometers of this. The mud was so deep, it was about yay deep, it came up over my shoes. I lost the bottom part of my hiking pole in it. Uh, but the pilgrims are so lovely, and so they actually, a person I'd never seen before, retrieved it and found me in the next town and said, oh, by the way, here's the rest of your hiking pole. And uh, so the terrain, you never know what life is gonna throw at you. And this is one of the themes of the Camino, and one of the things you have to get used to is the idea that at night we'd read the trip report together. So in my Camino family, so I went not knowing anybody. And on day four, I met Nikki, who became my best friend on the Camino. 
We were basically together 24-7 uh, for 34 days. And uh, the whole thing took me 38 days, so about 34 days. And uh, so I met Nikki, and then I met... Uh, Nikki is from South Africa. Uh, I met Alex from the States. He joined us soon after that. I met Micah and Lara, both from Germany, and they joined us. And then Paul from Ireland. And so the six of us became a Camino family. And we were pretty much together 24-7, staying in the same albergues, eating together for breakfast, lunch, and dinner whatever that might look like, every day for more than a month. And so we're very, very close. All of us miss each other very much. They're actually going to watch this recording. I told them I was going to preach about this, and I'm sending it. So a big shout out to my Camino family. They really made the whole trip amazing. <laughs> uh, fantastic. And so at night, we'd have dinner, and I'd pull out the trail map. And I'd say, okay, guys, here's where I think we should go based on this, based on the elevation and how long it's going to be. And, but we wouldn't know about things like the river of mud because life gives you things you can't anticipate. So, and I know Alex and I talked at the end, and he said, I think one of the main things I learned from this is that it's going to be okay. Like, really, it's going to be okay. I'm not going to know everything in advance. He said, I'm someone that kind of likes to know as much as I can before I go into, into something. But you can't, even if you look at the elevation, you know, and you look at the route and everything. And Nikki, it became an ongoing joke with Nikki and I that we'd get to a mountain. She's like, Kathy, why is this mountain here? You told me we only had one mountain today. What is this? And I'm like, Nikki, I'm not, I didn't put the mountain there. I promise. I'm not responsible for this mountain. <laughs> and, but we never know. And you never know what the weather is going to be. We had days that were supposed to be nice and it rained all day, and then vice versa, and then days where it couldn't decide, so you stop like 12 times to put on your rain gear and take it off and put it on. And so you don't know, but it's actually okay. It ends up being fine, like we get through it. And especially together, we had a family, we were always together, we get through it together. Uh, next slide, please. So also it became a joke that you never know what the food situation is gonna be. So I'm a vegetarian. I ended up being somewhat flexible on that because I was starving all the time <laughs> because you're hiking 25 kilometers a day. So I was mostly vegetarian. Uh, but we had days where there's nowhere to stop. So in the morning, everything's closed. There's no food at the albergue. There's nowhere to stop for breakfast. So we have food, hopefully, from the supermarket. Maybe, you know, usually we like to stop around 11 and get food. This was one of our stops. We're like, pull up the side of the road pull up a rock, you can sit on the side of the road. We had lunch one day sitting in someone's driveway because there was nothing open. On a Sunday, you'd find out, okay, everything's closed on Sunday, so we have to plan ahead and buy food in advance. We get to one beautiful spot, it's closed. It's like, oh, it's closed because it's a Wednesday. Why is it closed on a Wednesday? That doesn't make sense. Another place, oh, it's Thursday. What do you mean? It's Thursday. How are you supposed to prepare for this? So you never know. So, but we always shared our food. So together, Nikki and I, we'd pool our food together with all the rest. So again, we're traveling together. So together, we have enough food. Uh, one of our friends, Joan from Scotland, at one point, she's like, I just like days where we get breakfast and lunch. And I loved it so much. And, I, and Nikki knew I was going to use it in the sermon because I thought it was so hilarious. Like, your standards get so low that you're like, it is good to have breakfast and lunch. That is good. But otherwise, you just sit on the road or in the dirt or something. And this, too, is fine. It ends up being fine. We're OK. Next slide, please. Bunk beds. So you're sleeping in bunk beds almost the whole time. This day, we got to La Isla, and we'd gotten lost on the coastal route. Sometimes there were these extra routes that were supposed to be beautiful on the coast, and they were always treacherous because you lost them and you can't get anywhere. We got lost. This was our longest day. We did 36 kilometers when we like pulled into this place. So we usually Nikki and I were on a bunk bed, and she was on the bottom and I was on the top. Here we were all on the top because no one wanted to be on the top, so we're all on those. These bunk beds had no sides. I found that pretty stressful. This was the only time they didn't have any sides. But it was OK. No one fell off and hit their head and died. We made it. Nikki's bunk bed did have a spider in it, but it was a daddy long legs, so that was OK. It could be worse. And we're OK. And also, the way you get to know the people you're with, you're sleeping in these spaces. So you're like rooms with 25 bunk beds. You get to know the people who snore really loudly. One of our friends was so lovely, but she snored so loudly. So you'd get there and you see that she's there and you're like, oh no, which room is she in? Can we get in a different room? <laughs> we got to plan in advance, you know? So the way you get to know these people, you're literally together 24-7. But it's okay. And you're all equal. 
All of you look terrible. You're all wearing the same two sets of clothes and you're washing them in the sink. Or when, if you get a laundromat, everyone puts their clothes in. One time, 10 of us put our clothes in together in the laundromat and then I lost some of my clothes. I'm like, that's fine. Some other pilgrim has those now. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. You're okay. We're okay. It's a shared experience. You get through it. Next slide, please. Also, my ongoing problem was that I had blisters constantly, but everybody had some problem or another. Nikki would get foot cramps. Alex had an issue with his knee. Other people, Laura actually at the end had to go home in the last week because she had really bad shin splints. Everybody had something. Towards the end, we got the stomach flu. Everybody in the albergue, except Paul, got the stomach flu. Paul is my dear friend from Ireland. He's amazing. He was the oldest one in our family. He was invincible. He walked the furthest, he walked the fastest. He was the only person in our albergue who did not get the stomach flu. I don't know how he does it. But that night, we couldn't eat all day. We were throwing up, we were horribly, horribly sick. But that night, we kind of pulled it together and Micah and Lara made this pasta dish for us. And then we planned, how are we gonna get to the next town tomorrow? Because no one can hike 20 kilometers except Paul. So we ended up sharing a taxi to get there. But we were together, so it was okay. So if you have a family, if you have people around you, even when things suck, you get through it. You share your food, you share your resources. Together, we can do it. It's not so bad. If I was by myself, I wouldn't have done it. This was exactly one week before we got to Santiago, and I was really grumbling by this point, and I was like, I don't even like this anymore. I don't even want to go to Santiago. This sucks. This was a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. And my friends were like, you're going to be okay. You're going to feel better tomorrow. You'll stop throwing up. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and they were right. And it was good, and I stuck with it because of them. I don't think I would have stuck with it if it wasn't for them. But together, right, we share the load. Next slide, please. And so at the end, this is really a peak life experience. So you have this intense experience with these people. You're together for more than a month all the time. And so what happens is on the last day, we set it up. We only had 10 kilometers to go, which is like a walk in the park for us now. Our idea of what's a long hike is totally skewed. I'm gonna ask my family to go on a 30 kilometer hike thinking that's a normal request. And uh, so at the end, you get into the city and you can hear they have uh, traditional bagpipers playing Galician bagpipers. And so the way it works is you have the uh, cathedral and then you have the plaza in front of it and you're coming from this direction and you get nearby and you hear the bagpipers. And then you go through, you go down these steps and through a tunnel past them and you wind up in the plaza and suddenly we're all together and we're like okay guys and you can hear it and you're going past the bagpipers and everyone starts getting emotional and starts crying and you step into the plaza and you see all these people and everyone's crying and everyone's hugging and our friend Lily who I met on day two she was my oldest Camino friend from Manchester she said she'd gotten there three days earlier she was too fast we couldn't keep up with her and none of our friends were there to greet her because she was so fast so she wanted us to have a hero's welcome. So she actually knit these ivy crowns for us and got this whole picnic and had picnic with blankets and everything in the plaza in front of the cathedral. And it was seriously a life, like a peak life experience. So sitting with my friends, having this picnic, we all have these crowns, like we just won some massive thing. And then you look and you see the stairs and you see pilgrim after pilgrim hobbling down the stairs. Because for me, my problem was the blisters, but everybody had some problem. It was a joke that ibuprofen is Camino candy. <laughs> because everyone's taking it for one reason or another. So no one comes in striding in victorious. Everyone is like broken and hurting, but you come in and your friends all greet you. And it's this amazing thing, doing it together with your friends. So those are all my slides. So folks asked about spiritual lessons. So these are the spiritual lessons. Being in community, finding a community wherever you are, your people, even if you come from all different places, even if you don't speak the same languages. Google Translate got me through so many dinners. I got to connect with people who didn't speak English. I didn't speak their language. We really connected uh, in that way. Finding your people, doing things together, letting go of any kind of ego you have. I went in thinking like, I'm gonna get in really good shape. And then I basically hobbled for like 800 kilometers <laughs> because of my blisters. But everybody else hobbled for different reasons. So it was okay and you're all doing it together. So it's okay, it's not, it actually would have been worse if it had ended kind of like, look at me, look what I can do. Like it, it shouldn't be about that. Hopefully you got rid of that, like 200 kilometers in. You know what I mean? Like it shouldn't be about that. 
uh, but the fact that it's okay. I, um, I'd heard before I went that uh, it's a six week thing. So the first two weeks are like life with ups and downs. The second two is like death. And the last two is like rebirth. And I actually found that to be true. And when I got to the death stage, it was actually because it was total acceptance. Every day, you're like, okay, we have to go this far, no matter what the weather is, no matter how I feel, if I'm in pain, even if there's no food, even, you know, no matter what it is, I can handle it. And it felt amazing. It felt like what you get if you're meditating deeply for a long time. That total acceptance of the situation without any kind of resistance, without being in your ego about it, just being okay with anything that happens. And it was amazing, and I've still carried some of that with me. So when I was flying home last weekend, I flew uh, Santiago to Barcelona, Barcelona to Montreal, and then my flight from Montreal back to Vancouver got canceled. And I was sitting in the airport on the floor, because it's, it's really crowded in this terminal, and I have my little bag because I checked my rucksack. And I'm wearing the same clothes I've been wearing for six weeks and I look terrible. And I have like three things in my little bag and they cancel the flight. And I see people with a lot more luggage than me looking way nicer and wealthier than I look at this point. And, uh, and they're yelling at the poor ticketing agent who's probably like 25 years old. And like, you better put us in a nice hotel this, we can't believe this, this is the worst thing ever. And it was such a weird, I had such culture shock. Because I was like, I haven't been in a nice hotel in six weeks. I don't have anything with me, but I'm actually fine. Like, you know, there's a meme of a dog in a burning building, and he's saying this is fine. But that's, like, usually used in, like, a negative way. But what about the positive version of, like, you know what, I'm okay, actually. And so I went on my phone. I found that there was a hostel in Montreal. I've been staying in hostels the whole time. I got a bed. I showed up. I found out they had a towel which I was very excited about. I texted my husband, and I was like, I found a hostel with a towel. This is fancy. I don't know if I can handle this kind of luxury right now. And, and it was totally fine. And I was happier and more content than the people with all the other stuff. But if I hadn't just walked across Spain, I might have been one of those people, right? Like, we get so attached to our possessions and, and our schedule, and like, I'm going to know everything that's going to happen today. And I, I'm in control. I'm in control. I have it together. But what if you don't? What if you just let go of all of that? And you just sit with the other people on the side of the road. And you share your bread and three-day-old cheese. And you're fine. And so that's really what I got out of it. And I want to maintain that. Like, how do you maintain that when you're not on the road, you know? So that's what I got out of it. It was really amazing. Uh, so I hope that you get to do something like that, whatever that looks like for you, even if that's just meditating at home, or just praying, or just having a lot of dinners with your family. I hope you get to feel that. So no matter what life throws at you, you know this too is fine. I'm going to be okay. Thanks for listening. Amen. Amen.